for those of you who have a copy of The Book of Lies by Aleister Crowley. That's The Book of Lies by Aleister Crowley. There's a one-page chapter, chapter 33, that talks about the black two-headed eagle standing on a sword with a black triangle over its head. And it talks about Jacques de Molay. If you've got a book of lies, after today's talk, look up chapter 33 and perhaps find out more about Baphomet. Anyway, let's pick up where we left off yesterday. And we were looking at the historicity or the non-historicity of the Bible. The next obvious question comes becomes, who wrote the books of the Bible? Where these stories originate? And the answer is simple. We don't know. It's clear that multiple scribes and authors were involved. Many traditionalists believe the prophet Jeremiah wrote at least part of these texts. And we're, we're talking about the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Uh, traditionalists believe the prophet Jeremiah wrote at least part of these texts, but Jewish tradition, St. Jer Jerome, and many modern Bible scholars think Ezra the scribe or the person writing as Ezra slash Nehemiah edited and formatted much of the Pentateuch and several other Old Testament books, including Joshua, Judges, and the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And they believe they wrote those no earlier, no earlier than the 6th century B.C. Many secular scholars agree generally upon that 6th century date, but also suggest that the same author or authors actually penned the Pentateuch and at the very least had a hand in compiling and editing the books of Chronicles, Kings, and several other books of the Old Testament. There are literally hundreds of complex and convoluted theories of exactly who put pen to paper to create the books of the Old Testament. But most seem to dovetail in the uh, greater or lesser degree to the person or persons known in the Bible as Ezra. Furthermore, there's almost universal agreement that the works cannot be traced any further back in time than the 6th century BC. Prior to this, the historical and archaeological fingerprint of a Hebrew people united by a single religion occupying a nation with its headquarters in Jerusalem is non-existent. Indeed, According to Norman F. Cantor, uh, emeritus professor of history, sociology, and comparative literature of New York University, Rhodes Scholar, Porter Ogden Jacob Fellow at Princeton University, Fulbright Professor at Tel Aviv University, quote, the first millennium of Jewish history as presented in the Bible has no empirical foundation whatsoever. That's quite a statement. And I venture to say that most men and women of faith around the world would not believe it even if they were presented with uncontroversial proof. It would be a psychological blow of biblical proportions. <laughs> Forgive me. 
to anyone whose religious convictions are based upon the historicity of the Bible. It'd be an even bigger blow to the self-image and the geopolitical interests of contending political forces embroiled in today's Middle East conflicts. Combatants, who appear to be treating the pages of the Old Testament as if they were land grants, whose deeds of ownership were signed by God himself. Nevertheless, the unthinkable appears to be true. The kingdoms of David and Solomon are fable, not history. The idea of 12 distinct tribes of the children of Israel with a past reaching back to the 13th century BC was likely an ingenious concept fabricated in the 6th century BC or later to provide a single cultural and religious identity to the descendants of a diverse assortment of people with no cultural memory whatsoever. People whose ancestors came from a dozen or more regions conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. People whose real tribal ancestors were thrown together by the fortunes of world events who eventually had to be relocated when Babylon fell to the Persians. Because Palestine was an area undefended by a unified political or military presence, it was an ideal homeland for such a relocation. If considered in this light, both the Bible and Masonic tradition point the rational investigator to at least consider this scenario. If it all seems like something that could never happen, I need only point to the events of a little over a hundred years ago involving the American prophet Joseph Smith and his successor Brigham Young and the exodus of the Latter-day Saints to Utah. This revelation is indeed earth-shaking. And not everyone is capable of absorbing such a blow. It would, after all, lead one to speculate upon the unthinkable possibility that a good percentage of the wars, the genocides, the hatreds and feuds that have cursed Western civilization for the last 3,000 years have been and continue to be tragic arguments that began over nothing. It takes the mature pragma, uh, pragmatism of a true spiritual grown-up to even speculate on the implications of such matters. However, it needn't spell the end to one's faith in the holiness of Scripture. Yes, it's probably true that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. David didn't write Psalms, and Solomon didn't write Ecclesiastes or, or even the Song of Solomon. But somebody did. The holiness or the spiritual integrity of these documents is not diminished in any way by their lack of historic reliability. Ask any Kabbalist. Whoever wrote Genesis not only gathered and synthesized the creation myths of a handful of Semitic tradi traditions, he or she did so with the skill of an illuminated mathematician and the insight of a poetic genius. Whoever wrote Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon was a passionately devotional saint. These works will forever 
offer real spiritual treasures to the sincere de devotee. But to insist that they are also history is to invite their misuse by social and political entities who are always ready to engender and perpetuate fear and hatred between peoples and cultures and their own interests. For me, it is clear that masonry, either by design or accident or synchronicity, quietly affords her sons the opportunity to become, as it were, spiritual grown-ups. Good men made better by their work in the craft. Men whose concepts of God, whose concept of God is big enough to take a hit or two. Admittedly, this new view of the Old Testament's a pretty big hit. But unless we're blinded by superstition or bigotry, the readjustment of a few dates and the ability to distinguish between sacred mythology and viable history needn't destroy Scripture's place in our hearts as an unerring standard of truth and justice. But the majority of the Masons are Christians. We might now ask, how do Masonic ideals square with the New Testament? In the second degree of Masonry, the senior deacon in his magnificent middle pillar lecture delivers what might be viewed as a hit to the fundamental doctrine of Christianity. Standing between the stately pillars of the temple, he instructs the candidate that he is to, quote, pay rational homage to deity. I'll repeat that. Rational homage to deity. And then he goes on to inform him of the nature and meaning of operative masonry. And that by that term, we allude to, quote, a proper application of the useful rules of architecture, unquote. And that these rules not only display the effects of human wisdom, but they also, quote, demonstrate that a fund of science and industry is implanted in man for the best most salutary and most beneficent purposes." Unquote. What edifying words! What positive and encouraging words for a, a good man to hear at the beginning of his travels to become a better man! Who on earth could possibly disagree with these words? Paul. The Apostle Paul would have violently disagreed, and I believe it's highly likely that the Knights Templar believe they had every reason to violently disagree with Paul. And that's where we'll stop today. Tomorrow is chapter 10, The Crucifix. Well, that's the end of today's Sunday sermon. <laughs> I, I hope you're all enjoying these little excerpts from The Key to Solomon's Key, Secrets of Magic and Masonry, or is this the lost symbol of masonry? And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. It's another sweltering day in Costa Mesa. And in Southern California, uh, we're uh, a little further north of me. They're battling a lot of fires. So hold a good thought. Until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. 
Love is a law. Love under will. 